Fossils in rocks are living things that have been turned into stone. They give us clues of the past history of the Earth and can help us confirm whether evolution or special creation is a better model for interpreting the past. When an animal dies, it decomposes quickly. So if a fossil is discovered, it means that it was buried quickly. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Fossils and Earth History with Dr. John Whitmore. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcased interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. John Whitmore, is an active creationist researcher and writer. His research focuses on the geology of Noah's flood, especially concerning the rocks of the Grand Canyon which he has been visiting for over four decades. John started the geology program at Cedarville University in Ohio, where he has been teaching for over 30 years. He is also the editor for the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism, which is now located at the university. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Ray. It's good to be here today. What are we going to be talking about today? Uh, today we're going to be talking about fossils. I've studied fossils for most of my career and I think they really have some important things that they can teach us. First of all, what is a fossil? A fossil is an animal that's been turned into stone or it could be a, a plant like a tree that's been turned into stone and it gets petrified. So on the screen here we see a fossil stingray. Uh, from Wyoming and then there's a fossil trilobite. A trilobite is kind of like a crab or a crustacean uh, and th this has been turned into rock as well. And so fossils are things like this that we find in the rocks and they tell us a little bit about earth history. Hmm. So fossil isn't um, like a body, it's something like you said, it's turned into rock. That's right, it's an animal or plant that's been turned into rock. Okay, and, and how does that happen? Well, uh, there are uh, chemicals that, that migrate through uh, the sediment that the animal gets buried in, and oftentimes the minerals get deposited in the pore spaces and whatnot of, of bone or uh, shell material that the animal may have. Okay, okay. And when it comes to Noah's flood then, how does that interact with the fossilization process? So animals need to get buried uh, very quickly in order to turn into a fossil, but then there's fluids that uh, can migrate through the rock and deposit the minerals to, to make that animal uh, or plant uh, turn into rock. And we think that, that most fossils have formed uh, very quickly. Uh, in fact, we'll be talking about today, if you don't bury something uh, in mud or sand very quickly, uh, it won't become fossilized at all. And I think most people understand that, right? I mean, you drive down the road, there's a dead animal on the right. road and you see it decaying yeah, very quickly. Uh, animals rot and decay very quickly. Mm -hmm. There's only been one exception to that. Um, one time I, I drove past a porcupine uh, carcass along the side of the road and nothing came by <laughs> and <laughs> ate that. Yeah. But all, all other types of uh, carcasses, they, get, they decay pretty fast either by scavenging or bacteria and so on. And they eventually disappear and that's what we find commonly in the world today. So fossils are not something that are happening ordinarily. You need some kind of an extraordinary phenomenon to, cr to create the right That's circumstances. That's right. The fossilization process is really rare. Okay. Fossils can really uh, give us some important information. Uh, when we look at, at fossils, uh, they can tell us something about the past. Uh, fossils can tell us what the history of, of life was here in the earth. Um, and in the Pittsburgh area and Ohio and all across uh, the United States, in fact, across other continents, we have marine fossils that are the most common on top of the continents. 
And, you know, what better evidence for Noah's flood is, you know, than we find these marine fossils on top of the continents. You should be finding these in the ocean basins, right? But the, the fossils, these marine fossils are on the continents and they tell us that an ocean uh, used to be here. Uh, fossils uh, and the study of fossils can tell us whether Darwin's theory is correct or not. And fossils can, uh, again, show us that they were buried really quickly or made uh, really fast. Uh, you can't make a fossil slowly. That's interesting because I think the viewers would all say that when they read the textbooks or they go to the museum, they talk about these millions of years, right? That's Sometimes, right. you know, billions of years, for tens right. of millions of years um, for this fossilization process. Yeah, oftentimes a geologist uh, will admit to you that if there is a fossil, the rock had to be made quickly. And oftentimes uh, nowadays, uh, they don't put the time within the actual rock that has the fossil, they'll put the time in between the layers. Uh, so they gotta put the time in there somewhere so that time is now uh, in between the layers, not actually in the layer with a fossil in it. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So they're sort of admitting that that layer had to be quick, but then in between you can put what? That's where you put the time. And it's interesting because there are things that we can look for as geologists to find out if there really has been a lot of time that's elapsed uh, between rock layers or not. Okay. And so uh, we want to look at, at several things uh, regarding fossils. Uh, there's four lessons that, that we're going to uh, learn about today. Uh, fossils always indicate rapid burial. Uh, many fossils contain unfossilized tissues. In, in other words, not all of the soft tissue of, of fossils often gets removed. Uh, fossil uh, record is characterized by stasis and not evolution. So another way to put that is things don't change through time like Darwin predicted. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then finally, uh, number four, uh, marine fossils blanket all the continents. We have these marine rock layers on top of all the continents. And so we're going to uh, step through and walk through uh, these four points today. And that marine rock or marine fossils, those are fossils that are found in the ocean. Just for Yeah, so those are animals that live in the ocean. So we find those animals that formerly lived on the ocean, we find them on top of the continents. And Which would tell us at some point that was underwater. That's right, that's correct. So these are some fossil fish from Wyoming, and this is uh, part of the work that I did for my dissertation studies. I studied these fish. Uh, some of the fish are really nicely preserved, like this one or that one, and others, you can see the scales and the bones are all, all scattered around. And so what I wanted to find out is how did these fish uh, get preserved in, in this manner? And so I actually did a whole bunch of experiments with, with real fish in my laboratory, and then those experiments really smelled uh, because, <laughs> yeah, sure. because these fish were decomposing. But I was able to understand through those experiments uh, these fossils. Uh, this one's kind of interesting. You can see the, the body of the fish right here in the tail, but here the, the head has exploded. And with, with, with this, um, the fish had to be laying on the bottom of the lake, uh, there's gases that build up inside of it, and those gases are actually released uh, through the head to, to make the head uh, blow up. I wrote about this a little bit in uh, one of the early issues of Answers Magazine uh, that you can go look, look at. But from this, I learned that fish like this uh, had to be buried pretty fast mm. uh, to be preserved. And even uh, if days pass or if weeks pass, uh, the fish will more often look like some of these bottom pictures mm. because they, they decompose uh, very quickly in the laboratory. And so the first lesson is when you find perfectly preserved uh, fossils, those fossils had to be made uh, really quickly. And what I mean by that is they had to be buried by mud or sediment uh, to hold their tissues together. Even then, though, burial had to happen to preserve That's right. the parts, so right? So you're, you're not, the fish is not laying on the bottom of the ocean for thousands or millions of years waiting to get buried. It has to be made really fast. Something had to preserve it to stop the natural right. decay process. That's right. Here's some shells that I found on the beach. Uh, these shells are very thick and uh, very rigid and robust. Uh, these are razor clams, so they're very thin uh, shells. And... Um, 
as you look at the, the rock record, uh, you would expect if lots of time had passed that you might only find these and not these because scientists have done experiments, uh, they're called taphonomy experiments, where they actually put bags of these shells out in the ocean and watch how they decompose. And in today's settings, uh, these shells that are very thin and fragile, uh, as you would expect, decompose the quickest. Uh, they get bored into or chewed on and, and so forth. Uh, eventually, these shells do as well, but it takes a lot longer for these more robust shells uh, to decompose. But as we look at the fossil record, you might expect if the fossil record was made over long periods of time, you would expect the fossil record to be biased towards these thick, heavy shells. And studies have been done, and in fact, you find equal numbers of these uh, very delicate shells and these very thick, rigid shells in the rock record. Uh, so that indicates, it's another indicator uh, that the fossils were made uh, very quickly, that it, there weren't slow processes. Something outside of the fossil itself is making those two very different kinds of fossils last the same, so That's obviously. Right. Yeah. The, the only explanation that you can come up with is, is rapid burial. Um, something else that's really interesting, and, and this was kind of unexpected, is that many fossils contain soft tissues. Uh, so uh, there's a number of papers uh, that have been written. Uh, Thomas uh, summarized some of these, and I actually think he has a database now uh, where he keeps track of these, but there's a lot of literature that describes uh, soft tissues uh, still existing in fossils. So it's not true that all the soft tissues actually get replaced and removed. There's actually uh, soft tissues that, that still remain in fossils. And some of the most famous examples uh, were published by Schweitzer now in the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, and she's actually found like little blood cells and stretchy tissues and things like that in dinosaur bones. And it's not just been a dinosaur bone here and there. Uh, many of the bones that she's looked for have contained these soft tissues. And I think this argues very strongly that the fossil record is, is not only young, but these animals were buried quickly before any of these things could decay. So that mineralization process isn't complete, even in a dinosaur bone. That's it's right, and, and what you get is it just fills in the, the, the uh, empty space, but still the soft tissue is preserved, which is uh, really amazing. Um, another lesson uh, that, that we've learned uh, from the fossil record is that the prediction that Darwin made about the fossil record is not true. Um, and it's interesting to read Darwin's Origin of Species. Darwin was actually a really good scientist, and he critically analyzed his theory. And what Darwin suggested in the Origin of Species was that we would start off with simple animals and that over time, uh, those simple animals would turn into more complex animals. This is the evolutionary tree. And oftentimes, evolution is presented like this, and it's presented so often like this that people think this is actually what shows up in the fossil record. Uh, Darwin even made some sketches of, a, of an evolutionary tree in some of his notebooks and so on. But people think the fossil record looks like this, but it really doesn't. And Darwin even recognized this as he uh, wrote The Origin of Species. Uh, simple things, it's not true that simple things uh, show up and then complex things uh, show up gradually over time. Uh, when you go to the very bottom of the fossil record, you get all these complex things showing up all at once. And there's no transitions uh, between single-celled bacteria and all these uh, complex organisms. So, John, just to explain that for mm -hmm. our viewers again, that so when you talk about go, going deeper, you're talking about in the earth, right? Because That's their right. view is that over time, those layers pile up. And if Darwin was right, we would see the primitive animals down here and the more complex ones up here. But you're saying that's it's, not. It's not just primitive down here and complex up here. We should see transitions between right. the primitive all ones. All the way through, right? All the way to the complex ones. And here's what Darwin said, and this is from The Origin of Species, 1859. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain 
and it is perhaps the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. The explanation is I, lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. And so Darwin, he, he proposed this idea of evolution from simple to complex. He said the most obvious place to look is the fossil record. But the problem is, uh, when we look at the fossil record, we don't see all the transitions between the simple animals to the complex ones. We see complexity begin almost immediately right at the bottom of the fossil record. Darwin blamed this on maybe that the fossil record was imperfect. And yet, it's been 160 years since Darwin wrote The Origin, and this problem has not gotten any better. In fact, it's gotten worse. That's interesting. So he has a theory, but the evidence does not line up with the theory. That's right. And it's, I, I like Darwin because he recognized this early on. He recognized he a problem and a potential solution, but those solutions have not materialized. John, hold that thought. We got to take a break. Stay with us. More on fossils right after this. scientific materialism, the belief that life is nothing more than the product of blind, undirected processes. Why has our world chosen to push a pseudoscience that is neither fact-based nor provable, but instead is a narrative simply designed to push their own agenda? It is time to embark on an amazing journey as we delve into several facets of science. Paleontology, geology, astronomy, microbiology, genomics, and more. Each one of these areas confirming the work of our Creator. We're inviting you to come along with us in this unique presentation, The Miracle of Creation, for your gift of only $20. From Dr. Danny Faulkner and the wonders of our universe, to Dr. Marcus Ross and the discovery of soft tissue inside dinosaur bones, you will be captivated, entertained, and astounded as the true facts of science ring out, pointing to its author as the creator of all. To get your copy, write to Origins, Cornerstone Network, 1 Signal Hill Drive, Wall, PA, 15148, or call 412-824-3930. Get your DVD today for only $20 and find out how God has made himself known for all who are willing to see. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. John Whitmore, who's been sharing with us about the fossil record. John, we left off looking at what Darwin said about right. the fossil record. Right, so Darwin, I think, was, was a good scientist. And the way that this plays into what we're talking about today is that the theory of evolution is either gonna rise or fall uh, based on the fossil record. And Darwin understood that. And Darwin even admitted in the origin of species that we should have all these transitional forms, but he was aware that those transitional animals were missing. And he thought that uh, as the science of paleontology continued that eventually all these intermediate links would be found. And they haven't been. And so the fossil record is really important to us as creationists because the fossil record does not support the theory of evolution as Darwin proposed it. You know, I think that's crucial because when we say that, we're saying what we actually have, what we found. Darwin's whole excuse was, well, it's imperfect. Mm -hmm. We haven't found them yet. They're yeah. there, right? They're there. We haven't right. found them. And, and that's really still the thing that they're saying. Well, they're there. We just haven't found them. That's right. It's been 160 years since Darwin Thousands wrote. Thousands of fossils we've discovered, right? Tens of thousands. Yeah, hundreds of lots thousands. and lots more fossils. And as paleontologists, we're beginning to think that we have found just about everything that will be found. Hmm. And uh, it's really amazing that, you know, we still haven't found these transitions. But, of course, that's what the Bible would predict. The Bible says God created the creatures according to their kind. Frogs don't change change into chickens or whatever right. at a million That's years right. and you can get whatever you want. Yeah. So 
Well, we have one more lesson, I believe, that you That's were going right. to show us. And lesson number four, and this is something that I realized as an undergraduate geology major. I, I loved uh, collecting fossils and so forth as a kid. And finally, I realized when I, when I got to college that all of these fossils I'm finding in Ohio and, and in other places, Kansas, Grand Canyon, uh, this is on the continent. And these fossils I'm finding are marine fossils. So, you know, why did I find a shark in Kansas? That's because it, you know, it used to be covered by an ocean. Mm -hmm. And so the fossil record is important to us as creationists because it, it really is one of the best proofs that Noah's flood really happened. We find all these marine strata on top of the continents. And here's what a typical uh, continent looks like. Uh, the core of the continent is granite. But then at the surface, in most places, uh, we see this thin veneer uh, right in here of marine strata sitting on the continents. And these marine strata include marine fossils, things like sharks, things like trilobites, brachiopods, uh, different kinds of echinoderms like starfish and, and those kinds of things. And these are found on the continents. In fact, you know, what we're primarily missing in the ocean out here is a lot of marine strata. There's not very much marine strata in the ocean. And, you know, it's, it's quite thin. And it, it really demonstrates that at one point, the ocean probably came up and the continents uh, got dropped down a bit and the continents were covered with marine water. And the marine layers that we see spread across every single continent uh, I think is one of the best proofs uh, that Noah's flood actually happened. So the record itself would say everything, right? I mean, we're talking about mountaintops, right? Everything right. was underwater at one time. That's right. And it's not that, you know, sea level increased to the tops of the mountains that we have today. Um, a lot of those mountains, I think, were made in, uh, by processes that happened at the end of the flood. But we really do think that the continents uh, dropped down a bit uh, during the flood and the oceans came on top of them. John, would the, an evolutionary geologist, would he admit that, well, yes, at one time everything was under the ocean? Yeah, they, they have to admit that because, you know, the fossils uh, show that the marine strata was on top of the continents. So let's look at a few examples of this. Uh, this is uh, close to where I live in Ohio. And these are limestone layers. Uh, these limestone layers uh, have fossils uh, in them, marine fossils in them. And, um, you know, they, they are very extensive. And uh, here's another uh, uh, picture from almost my backyard at the university. Uh, these are dolomite layers in Cedarville. And so these, uh, these rock layers right here uh, are marine. They extend up into places like Chicago and Niagara Falls and so on and they have marine fossils in them. Uh, we can go to places like the Grand Canyon, a place that I go uh, usually several times a year, and you stand at the top of the Grand Canyon as I'm taking this photograph, I can look down at my feet and see fossils of sponges and corals and things like that in the rock. And Grand Canyon is 6,000, 7,000 above, feet above sea level where I'm standing. And so, you know, at some point the continent had to come down, the ocean waters uh, came in and made all these marine rock layers. Uh, tremendous evidence for the flood. We can go to places like Colorado. And this is uh, right outside of Colorado Springs. And again, uh, these are uh, marine rock layers that we have right here. In fact, it's really interesting, this layer right here we can trace that layer right there from the Grand Canyon all the way to Greenland. Mm. I've even seen this layer in Israel, and it's not very thick, uh, but you know, it's, it's a worldwide layer that, that is there, and it has marine fossils in it. So something was happening across the world that was water in its basis that put down, and, and then of course had to happen quickly because if there wouldn't be any fossils if it was just normal That's sedimentation. Right. That's right. So. And so things like this indicate that, you know, there's, there's marine layers on the continents. This is my favorite fish fossil. It, uh, if you look closely at this, uh, there's this big fish uh, right here, of course. And this is hanging on the wall of the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And you look close, and there is a second fish right inside the big fish. So you can see it's, 
its tail right there and its head right here. You can see what he had for supper. Yeah, and so this fish had not even been digested. Uh, this comes from Kansas, so it's a marine uh, fish from Kansas and indicates that the, this marine fossil layer was made very quickly and I think during the flood, this, this had to be buried even before the fish began to be digested. So this, yeah, this fish had to eat the other fish and then itself get buried very quickly or else we wouldn't have another fossil inside a fossil. That's right. And so today we've talked about uh, four different lessons. Uh, fossils have to indicate rapid burial. There's no other way to explain uh, how a fossil got there. Uh, many fossils contain unfossilized tissue, uh, especially uh, this has become known in dinosaur bones, but other fossils have this unfossilized tissue as well. Uh, the fossil record uh, does not support Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, when we see a fossil in the fossil record, it stays the same. It doesn't change or, or evolve. And then finally, these marine rock layers blanket all of the continents. And, and in my opinion, one of the very best evidences for Noah's flood. John, I think this is a fantastic presentation because all four of those lessons are things that are demonstrably true. Everyone knows. Right. If they're going to admit the facts at all, that those four things are true. And what that's we're right. showing is that that's what the Bible says. That's right. The fossil record supports scripture. John, I want to thank you for being on the program. We're out of time, unfortunately. You're welcome, Ray. I hope you can join us again sometime. I will. The fossil record is the Earth's own history book by which we can look into the past and see what came before us. This record, as we've seen today, is a powerful body of evidence against the secular theory of evolution and its millions of years and in favor of the Bible's record and its thousands of years. It just goes to show you that we know that what the Bible says is true and the proof, as we say all the time, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this Creation TV program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together and reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this program, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2201, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.